subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello and welcome again to our practical physics lessons on the Joy Learning TV channel. I'm glad to come your way to complete what began not let go in our previous lesson. And next, Rabbi Albert is my name. You can call me Pius. We've been looking at simple pendulum experiment with a stopper. We tried to look at understanding the question, trying to get to know the setup. Then we went ahead to take the needed measurements and then we oscillated for our values. We tried to make sure we are on the right track by having a trend in the values obtained. Now that we have a trend in the values obtained, then we can go back to our table and complete the table. Mind you, the table comes from the question given to us. So from the question, we are asked to find time for 20 oscillations. And this time should be the mean of the various times taken. So we go back there and do just that. So, don't forget we had 20 oscillations and for each of them we had time 1, time 2 for each length or each height given to us. So for the first one we have 33.89 plus 33.96 and I will divide that one by 2. That is going to give me 33.925. So 33.925. I'm not going to write all these in the space. Why? From the stopwatch, I can write up to two decimal places. Now, I will not write 33.93, although the number behind 2 is 5. Because you've learned that if you do a pragmatic in your table, your error margin might be that wide. So, I'm going to write this as 33.92. So 33.92 seconds. So that'll be it for our first value. Then for the second value, I have 35.09 plus 35.19. Then I'll divide by 2. I'm getting 35.14. Third set, we have 37.87 plus 36.76. Then I'll divide by 2. I have 37.315. So 37.31. The fourth set, 38.13 plus 38.15. That's giving me 76.28. And I divide by 2. That gives me 38.14. Then the last set, 39.33 plus 39.07 divided by 2, we have 39.2. I like this particular value because it helps us to learn. That's all I'm having, 39.2. But go back to the column again. We said that for a column, you should have the same number of decimal places. A column is from top to down. When I pick this value, I have two decimal places. I mean two numbers coming after the first two numbers. So after the decimal point, I have two numbers afterwards. That's what I'm talking about, two decimal places. So after this decimal point, I have this nine and this two. So we have two decimal places. Same here, after this point, I have one, four. After this, I have three, one. After this, I have one, four. But look at here. After this decimal point, I have only a value, one decimal place. So if you leave this like this, the examiner is going to circle this 
and deduct max from you. So what do you do? You add up a zero to also be up to two decimal places. These are very important. You are, you are so prone to forgetting about these things. You can just write it and leave the zero there because in your evaluation, it gave you only 39.2. Now, it says period. How do you find a period? You divide your times by the total number of oscillations. That is how you get your period. Very important. So I'm going to have time, which is my T, over the number of oscillations, which is 20. Mind you, it is not always 20. Sometimes it could be 10. So depending on the number of oscillations the question or the question asks you to go by, you take it like that. So I have 33.92 divided by 20. And I have 1.696. Again, I'm going to maintain two decimal places in that column. Of course, I could do three, but I have t squared here too, which I want to do three decimal places. So it's say five, if I go by two. So I'll write this as 1.69 and not 1.70. I won't approximate. So 1.69 becomes my value. All right. 35.92. Divided by 20, I have 1.757. So that will be written as 1.75. Then I have 37.31. Divided by 20, I have 1.8655. So 1.86. Good. I have 38.14 divided by 20. I have 1.907. So 1.90. Then I have 39.20 divided by 20. I have 1.96. So this one too, my values are increasing down the column. 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, This is even higher than this. So that's it. Then it says H inverse. H inverse. Don't spend time trying to key in H inverse from your calculator. It's the same as finding the square root of H. So you go back to H. These are the values for H. So we find a square root of these values. Then we put them in this column. So root of 45. And you don't leave it in sets. It should be in decimal places. So I have 6.708. I could have made it 6.708 three decimal places. But I'm going to plot or I could just maintain it like that. In order to bring variety, let us pick for this particular column three decimal places and same as the last one. So 6.708. And I'm not going to approximate. Root of 55. 7.708. The root of 65, I have 8.062. Root of 75, I have 8.66. Zero. Then I have root of 85, 9.219. So 
So that is it for h inverse or h to the power half. Then c m to the power half. Then our last column, t squared. So where's my t? This is my t. And I'm asked to square it. Then look at my unit, second squared. So t squared, second squared. All right, so I'm going to have t squared. T is 1.69 squared. I have 2.8561. I want to write this to three decimal places. And it should follow suit in that column. So 2.856. Then I have 7.4, 1.75, sorry, 1.75 squared. I have 3.062. Then I have 1.86 squared. I have 3.459. Then I have 1.90 squared. 3.61. So I'll come back to this. Now I have 1.96 squared. Three point eight four one. So when I look at the last column, I began with three decimal places for each of them. But this one gave me up to only one, two decimal places. And that is all I had from the evaluation. But for the sake of uniformity, then I have to put a zero here so that the whole column, each of them will be up to three decimal places. So when you look at your table and you're able to find a trend like this, then you should be happy. Because when you plot the values, you're going to get the line of best fit going through at least three points that you have plotted. Three points. So we are able to do almost everything the question is asking us to do. Now, we are asked to state or it seems to determine the intercept C on the vertical axis. So we are asked to plot a graph also. So we're going to try and look at some of the things we should take note of as we try to plot the graph. Very important. So, we are going to assume that I'm going to try and see how we go about plotting the graph. Now, it says plot a graph with t squared on the vertical axis and h on the horizontal axis. So a graph of t squared on the vertical axis and h on the horizontal axis. Then we are asked to find the intercept on which of the axis it says C on the vertical axis. So that is why I want to do this. 
So I'm, I'm going to draw my axis. This becomes my vertical axis. And this one becomes my horizontal axis. Once you've drawn your axis, the next thing you do is you label. So I have t squared in second squared. Then h. So h in centimeters. The reason for which I want to do this is that you have been limited in the way to choose a scale for these axes. Very important. You've been asked to find an intercept on the vertical axis. It means that your graph may either be a graph that will cut the vertical axis this way. That's a possibility. Or this way. That's one possibility. So we have to look at that. Is the graph going to be a downward graph this way with an intercept somewhere here? There'll be an intercept here. Or an upward graph this way with an intercept here. Or it could even be here with an intercept on the axis this way. So how do I know that? Okay, we can try. If we pick the formula for the period of a simple pendulum, it says t is equal to 2 pi square root of L on G. Here, we're going to replace our L with H because we had H in the diagram for the lengths that we used. So I'm going to get T. Here, L is H. So T will give me 2 pi root of h on g. We are plotting t squared. Where's my red marker? t squared against h. So I need to get t squared in my expression. So I'll square both sides of the equation to give me t squared is equal to 2 squared before pi squared. Now, if you square everything under the root sign, h on g, like this, the square takes away the square root sign. So you're going to get t squared equals 4 pi squared h on g. Now, let me write this to conform with the equation of a straight line, which says y is equal to mx plus c. So what am I plotting on the vertical axis, which is the y-axis? t squared. So t squared will come here. What am I plotting on the horizontal axis or the x-axis? It's h. So this h must be at where this x is. So I'm going to get 4 pi squared over g times the h, like that. Do I have any other thing attached to this? No. So I'll still be plus 0. So now from this diagram, from this expression, I can see that if I plot t squared on the vertical axis here against h on the x or horizontal axis, this one, I have no intercept. I'm seeing c like this. Wow. Then I have a gradient. M, which is 4 pi squared g. And it's a positive gradient. So it tells me that my graph will be an upward graph. So if I plot a graph of t squared against h, I will get an upward graph. Why? My gradient is a positive gradient plus 4 pi squared on g. So let's go back to the graph. And let me show you something very important to do as you try to draw the graph. So let's say we've drawn 
are axis, vertical axis, and then horizontal axis, and they have been labeled t squared, s squared, h in centimeters. Now, you have been asked to start or to find the intercepts on vertical axis. Now, this is our vertical axis. As you move on this vertical axis, what is the value of the x-axis or the horizontal axis that you're going to encounter? So as you move on the vertical axis, you encounter the horizontal axis at this point. So we say the value of this horizontal axis on the vertical axis is zero. In other words, as I move on the vertical axis, I will only need to come across the horizontal axis at this point here. So when you are asked to find intercept on the vertical axis, you must begin the horizontal axis from zero. This is very important. Anytime you are asked to find intercept on the vertical axis, you must begin the horizontal axis from zero. So this one will start from zero. And look at the values for H. You have 45, 55, 65. So it depends on you. You can make it 0, 20, 40, 60, 80. So maybe 20, 40, 60, 80, and go on to 100 on your graph. And this interval will be enough to get all the values for h. But all I need you to understand is that you must begin this horizontal axis from zero because you're supposed to find an intercept on the vertical axis. And the value of this horizontal axis on this vertical axis is zero. So you always have to make sure that you do that. Now, check my scale from zero to 20. The difference is 20. From 20 to 40, the difference is also 20. From 40 to 60, also 20. You maintain a constant. You have to maintain a constant interval on one axis. Very important. You can't have more than one interval on the same axis. For example, let's say I have this 0 and I have 20 here. Then I go here and I continue with, let's say, 30. Then I move on with, let's say, 40 and 50. This is problematic. I have a problem here. Why? I have more than one interval on the same axis. Why? From 0 to 20, the difference here is 20. So 20. But from 20 to 30, the difference is 10. This minus this will give me 10, but this minus this is 20. So the examiner will mark this incorrect and say your skill is wrong. So you can't have more than one interval on the same axis. If you do that, you won't score the mark for scaling. All right. Now, you also have to avoid what you call breaking of the line. Breaking of the line. So, you start with zero here, as I said you should do, because of the constraint. Then, you do something like this, and you put maybe 50 here, then you move on to 60, 70, which you do normally in other areas. But in the physics practical, as much as possible, avoid breaking off the line. Don't do it. Don't do it. Make sure you get value that will accommodate all that you need, you need to to plot. Don't go by breaking the line. Now the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to this graph here is that after I have my labelings 20, 40, 60, 80, thereabouts, I also have to put a value here which tells me the beginning of the vertical axis. And look at my values I'm supposed to plot I should know where to start. So as you know, I start from 0 0.5, then I'll put 0 0.5 here. 
before maybe 1.0, then maybe 1.5. Then I continue. So you can see that the zero here starts for the horizontal axis this way. And then the zero, the 0 0.5 here, still at the same point here, starts for the vertical axis. This is acceptable. You can do that. So you don't leave here blank like this. And just write 1.0, 1.5 and continue. So what value is here? Is this zero? If we assume this is zero here, then you get this scale to wrong because zero to one is one. This interval here will give you one. This minus this will give me one. But 1.5 minus one will give me 0 0.5, half. So it, no, it will happen that on this axis too, you have different intervals on the same axis which is not acceptable, which is wrong. That is the reason why I'm supposed to put a value here for, for the examiner to know the starting point of the vertical axis. And this becomes that of the horizontal axis. Take note of these things. These are the problems candidates have when you get to marking the WASI. So I'm digging with 0 0.5, I put it there before I continue with other levels. Now the question is asking us for precautions, for precautions before we also ask another last question for four marks. So what are the precautions to be taken as we go through this experiment? Of course, every experiment, there will be some precautions. There will be some precautions. So what are the precautions to be taken? So just for this experiment, we can look at two, three precautions, and then we are good to go. So precautions taken. Number one, we used a stopwatch. We also used the meter rule. So, Anytime you use a stopwatch or use a meter rule, you have to avoid what we call parallax error. So you say, I avoided parallax error when reading from the stopwatch or from the meter rule. Please, you have to make mention of the instrument that you took that precaution when you were working with it. So, Number two, I was saying that for each of the lengths, we have to repeat the timing of the oscillations. So you say the timing of oscillations was repeated, or the timing was repeated to avoid random errors. The last one, you could see that in our lab here, we did not put on the fan. Why? The wind can interfere with the experiment. It's because we call damping. So we switched off the fans to prevent wind interference. So the fans were switched off to prevent wind interference. So even in your school lab, when carrying out such experiments, we advise you to close some of the windows, close some of the doors to prevent the wind from getting into the lab. 
it may end up damping the experiment. It may end up damping the experiment. Then, at the end of every experiment, you are given a question to answer for four marks. And that question is appearing on your screen. It says, define amplitude of an oscillating body. Very important. What do you mean by the amplitude of an oscillating body? When a body is oscillating, what do you mean by its amplitude? So we get to write or define amplitude of an oscillating body. So I'll say the amplitude of an oscillating body is the maximum displacement of the body from its rest its rest position now let me lay some emphasis the amplitude of an oscillating body is one maximum if you don't mean the word maximum you will not get a mark it's the maximum displacement of the body from its we call it rest position or mean position when i get back to my setup as the bulb is not oscillating it is at its mean position or what we call rest position it's not moving it's at rest. Now, if I try to oscillate it, I must displace it. Let me say I move it from here to where my hand is here. This becomes its amplitude from where it was here to where it gets here now. That would be its maximum displacement from the rest position. If I leave it and I allow it to oscillate, it will never go back and come and hit my hand again until maybe an external force acts on it. So if I leave it, it goes, it comes back. You see, it will never touch my hand again. So its maximum displacement from when it was at rest to where I picked it, it became the amplitude. And the body's amplitude will be decreasing with time because there will be air resistance as the body was lit. So the amplitude is the maximum displacement, the maximum distance it can move from where it was at rest to where you release it and then it will go through the oscillation. Then the last part of our practical work will be giving a question, and very often a short, simple question on the topic under discussion. Here, it's simple harmonic motion, and they're asking us something small, something little. It also involves some circular motion questions. This is a body of mass 0.5 kilograms. So we try and put down our parameters. The mass of the body is 0.5 kilograms. Here we are very lucky. It has been given to us in the SI unit. So mass M um, 0.5 kilograms. Then it says revolves in a horizontal circle of radius 0.7. So our radius. R is 0.7 meters with a period of 0.5 seconds. So our period is capital T is equal to 0.5 seconds. Then it says calculate the centripetal force acting on the body. Wow. So we want centripetal force. So let me see. F is my centripetal force. Why is it repeat that force? The body is moving in a circular path. So the body is undergoing circular motion. Now, when the body is undergoing circular motion, it will need centripetal force to keep it in circular motion because centrifugal force, which is a reaction, will be acting on it. Now, we have two formulae for centripetal force. Either F is equal to 
m omega squared r or f is equal to m v squared over r. So that's what we have. So which of them will help us to solve our question? Is it f equals m omega squared r or f equals m v squared over r? Looking at the parameters given to us, I have m, I have r, they are both there, m and then r, r. But t is here. T should help us to find one of these, either omega or that. T will help us to find omega. So we're going to use this first formula. So this one will be out, and we'll use this. So I'm going to use F equals M omega squared R. Omega, which is angular velocity, is equal to 2 pi on T. So 2 pi over T. 2 pi over T. So, and I'm going to square it. So, F will give me M and then 2 pi over T all squared times R. That will be it. So, we put in the values. So, F will give me, what's our M? 0 0.5 into bracket 2. In the question, we're not giving pi. So, you maintain pi on the calculator. So, pi... What's our t? 0 0.5. And they've all been squared times r, which is 0 0.7. So you take your time, you compute this on your calculator once and for all. So 0 0.5 times. So we have 2 pi over 0 0.5 all squared times 0 0.7. Make sure you have it done, just like it, has, it appears on your screen. Then I'm having an answer here, 55.5 five point This is force, so new thing. 55.270. So it could be 55.3 new thing. So that brings us to the end of the last question for today's practical section. I believe you have enjoyed the practical work. You've seen how simple it is. The more of it you go through, the better you become at it. So we will get it covered here on the Joy Learning TV channel with our practical lessons. I hope to come your way another time with something so fascinating, so interesting. And then Pabi Albert is my name. You can call me Pius. So I come your way again. We say joy learning, keep learning. It's bye for now. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.